Hey everyone, and welcome to this uh, 12th installment of our lectures on peace studies. I hope you're well. Um, we're talking this week about the readings from Albert Camus, uh, Gandhi, and um, Jean Sharp. And uh, the theme this week is nonviolence. Um, I think there's a lot to be said about nonviolence that uh, doesn't usually come up in the in the conversations we tend to have on an everyday basis uh, where in I mean that I think peace studies outside of the academic debates about peace studies I mean most people think that nonviolence advocates are kind of hippies or weak-minded or lazy uh, all of these points are of course raised in the introduction um, by our uh, our our, our editor uh, here, uh, Baresh. So um, what else is there to learn about peace studies? Well, I think there's a bit more under the cover, and that's what we're going to try to figure out this week. Um, we're going to look at Camus' rhetoric. Um, of course, Camus being famous for having written several books, including L'Etrangere, uh, which, in which famously he uh, recounts the murder of, a, of an Arab by uh, a, a man who seems to be cut off from the world. Uh, he is cut off from any sense of uh, reality, uh, connection to his reality, rather might be a better way to put it. And uh, the book famously sort of just, uh, you know, ignores the emotional facet of the man's death. And, and this is, uh, of course, it's an accidental death, really. And the, the man, the, the murderer is, is not in his right mind, it seems, uh, when he does it. But he's, regardless, disturbingly cold afterwards and we might say now the man was having a nervous breakdown or something but it's, it's not clear it's not clear in the in the novel um, that that's the case uh, so uh, we have Camus we have uh, Gandhi who takes a fairly dogmatic stance on what it means to be nonviolent and uh, uh, he 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 doesn't seem to wish to negotiate this at all um, and that's fine of course um, but the questions are why like on what basis and of course if we don't talk about Gandhi's spirituality, we don't understand the basis of his argument, and so I think that's going to be important for us to sort of nail that down. Um, and then Jean Sharp um, taking the uh, question up a level or two to look at the question of what it means not just to be sort of um, a peace, uh, a peaceful protester or a non nonviolent resistor um, within the state, but for nation states themselves to become nonviolent, to train their citizens in the art of nonviolent protest, uh, to perhaps convert the very basis of international relations over to a world where an international relations itself becomes guided by the principle of nonviolence. And, and uh, that is a very bold and, and thoughtful and radical idea indeed. So we want to try to cover all of that in the next hour or so. Um, so Albert Camus, um, of course, uh, tells us in his uh, in his piece here that we live in the century of fear, and I think here he's really echoing themes that have been you know brought to the table by a variety of other theorists, including uh, Horkheimer and Adorno, which we don't study in this class, but they're sometimes referred to as cultural Marxists or cultural Marxist theorists. Um, they famously wrote in uh, Dialectic of Civilization. Um, that uh, basically modernity itself was a problem. Uh, the rationalization of, of, of our lives, the rationalization of human life, the, the industrialization um, of, of human existence is, is not just something that happens in the factories, but, but because of the r relationship of technology to the way we organize and structure our lives, uh, we become increasingly rationalized in that process. And so um, in a way, um, and they didn't mince their words here, they, they suggested that um, the modernization of human existence led directly to um, the Holocaust. And I think Camus was sort of echoing these words here. Uh, he was a member of the uh, Algerian Communist Party for a while, but he never outed himself as a Marxist. Possibly because he wasn't one, you know, um, and I'm not sure really at the end of the day that Horkheimer and Adorno are especially Marxist. They seem to um, 
be more interested in the contradictions of enlightenment culture than they are in the contradictions of capitalism or at least if they are interested in capitalism they sort of walk the fine line and it's it's hard when you're reading them to figure out which they seem to put more emphasis on uh, but certainly they see the bourgeois individual as an individual that is also a product of techno-rational civilization and so if we ask ourselves why do we live in a city century of fear from Camus perspective at least um, I think it's clear that the reason we live in a, a century of fear, the reason we live in a techno-rational civilization, um, it, and that these things are, are terrifying, is because of the impact um, that this civilization has, uh, this, this it's sort of rationalization in the way we are taught at school and everything, the way we become sort of economically minded, is that we really are remote from each other. We are cut off from the future. We think only about ends and means in the here and now as we move uh, towards accomplishing our goals. Um, we don't stop for anything. We don't take time out. We don't um, uh, pause to, to sort of appreciate beauty. And I think when he says we're cut off from the future, it means effectively that we have no real sense of our uh, deep and abiding responsibility to those who will come after us. We, we um, just follow the clock, you know, we're tick-tocking people living in the system. And there's plenty of philosophers that have offered these sorts of views, so, so Camus is not the only one here. But, but Camus, I think, is important point is that he believes that the only way to remedy this is a commitment to non-violence, and I suppose that's why we... Um, we want to pursue him uh, here in this class. Um, he asks the question: Is it you know utopian uh, to want to to pursue nonviolence? He says that people who who say this can't really imagine what it's like for someone else to die. They can't really imagine the experience of someone else actually passing away. And in that sense. Um, we, uh, uh, just as we're cut off from the future, we've also instrumentalized each other. We've turned each other into just means to an end. Uh, we treat each other as, as, um, as tools. And um, that's not a, a healthy way to live. There's, there's no real way or relationship we can, um, uh, you can imagine in that kind of a, a philosophy of instrumentalization that would produce peace. So there's a need then um, for rethinking, and I think this is actually very Horkheimer and Adorno, you know, that there's a, a need for a new social contract, a new way of thinking, a new sociable culture or style of life, as Camus says, which um, will uh, direct us uh, more authentically towards uh, a relationship with each other. For Camus, then, I think the, the, uh, the real question is to sort of develop insights that will lead us to develop this sociable culture um, to develop or to move towards this social contract and it seems that he's making a philosophical argument here um, that as he says there's a need for a kind of an honest realism and so our our question is how does he set out the terms of this honest realism we, we've studied realism in various iterations before primarily most of you have taken my international relations class so you'll know a little bit about realism but there's different kinds of realism that, that exist outside of international relations. There's philosophic realism and, and many other types of realisms. But I think here it's not uh, harmful to imagine that what he's talking about here is a kind of international relations realism, which of course has a reputation for being somewhat cynical and instrumentalizing itself, um, a la Henry Kissinger and uh, his arguments uh, that it didn't really matter about the ideology of Americans, uh, America's allies so long as America won. Uh, so, um, an honest realism, what would that look like? Uh, an honest realism that was committed, um, I suppose there's two things being said there, a commitment to um, a kind of a, uh, an honest understanding of what man's needs are, like uh, that we can't instrumentalize each other to death, but also a realism that recognizes the adversity that's facing us and the kind of changes that we're going to need to make in order to survive the kind of current cataclysm that's going on in our relationship uh, on this increasingly globalized planet. So, so to pitch this uh, realism to us, he uses the term prime mover. I think he's trying to make an ontological claim here, you know, that there's, there's something in the furniture of the world that we need to tend to in, and repair, perhaps, if we want to uh, accomplish our, our goals. 
And um, uh, what what is this prime mover? Well, he says uh, that uh, we need to think about the the the, the future generations and um the 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 he he asks what is realism anyway only a regard for the future and um that is that is uh, you know an an interesting turn on realism of course realism is always a regard for the future and the threat of the future the shadow of the future in fact is a term that's commonly used in realism but um here he uh, is talking about the shadow of the future in rather different terms than we are uh, used to to regarding it. So he is emphasizing education, uh, press relations, public opinion um, as means to sort of bend the arc of the future towards sociability and discourse and dialogue. Um, so the prime mover then, this regard for the future, uh, we should uh, recognize that we can't change it all at once. Uh, change comes slowly. Uh, peace cannot happen um, all at once. But there is a need to to uh, save what can be saved and uh, to create a chance for survival uh, for the later generations. And of course, he mentions his personal decision, and uh, this is interesting, the idea that sort of comes up again later in Gandhi, which is that, you know, I'm going to personally choose to be peaceful and I don't necessarily care if everyone joins me all at once, but I believe that through my own personal example, I can create these permissive conditions for a future to come into existence. Um, sociability, then, is the solution, he says, and it starts with the individual. It starts with him. Hopefully other people will follow. Um, I think there's a possibly an issue with translation here as well, insofar as the, um, the, the French term here is 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 more uh, perhaps accurately described into in English as a, as a sort of a open-mindedness towards dialogue um, and uh, I think there's something like that being being put forward here as well um, can we escape history can we escape the curse of the past he's not convinced that we can um, we can't just change everything nation states uh, are a legacy of our history. They will they will sort of continue on with us into the future. But um, it's not plausible that we can continue on the planet if we don't make some progress here. So the fact that nation states will persist may indeed be true, but we have to make um, some sort of transformation. We have to engage in a modest thoughtfulness, he says, um, if we are going to have any chance at all. And um, does this mean we will succeed? No. But um, we have a possibility to uh, succeed, but we'll need to, to gamble, he says, as a formidable gamble, a formidable risk. But um, it's worth taking if uh, we can preserve the planet and preserve our future generations, uh, who will surely perish if we don't. So, um, moving on now, we uh, want to talk about Gandhi. And there's a lot of Gandhi in the extract. Um, it's uh, worth breaking some of this down into a constituent elements because, of course, it's quite philosophical and it's related quite deeply to um, to the philosophy of uh, of Buddhism, of Hinduism. Uh, there's different sorts of uh, elements of those. Both of those religions uh, sort of overlap with each other in some respects, especially in relation to their commitment to higher duty. But one of the key um, elements of Gandhi's writing, of course, would be the um, notions uh, from the Bhagavad Gita, which we'll be looking at in another lecture soon. Um, the Bhagavad Gita is the famous text uh, which recounts the battle, uh, or the, the night before the battle, that Arjuna, the prince, has to face, and Krishna appears to him as a charioteer and uh, they have a dialogue about Arjuna's fears. He doesn't want to fight in the battle, and Arjuna tells him that he must uh, confront his fears and um, put uh, his regard for himself and his personal pride on the shelf. And many people take that as a metaphor for going to war and needing to steel yourself and going to war, but it's not clear that that's what's meant actually at all. It's more... 
uh, likely that uh, uh, many people have interpreted at least that it's it's about the personal decision to to become selfless to to use what Gandhi calls soul force to put um, the, the the idea of what is righteous ahead of one's uh, uh, desire to to um, to live a a perhaps um, satisfactory life in a in a more physical sense. So um, I would think that Gandhi is someone worth thinking about actually quite a bit in relation to the Occupy movement. Um, as as many people today would claim that Occupy, uh, I'm thinking of David Graeber's work. Uh, if you want to look him up, some of you have looked at him before in other classes. But Graeber argues that anarchist policies and, and strategies for social transformation uh, such as those used in Occupy, which are ostensibly nonviolent uh, and, and theatrical in their nature, are really only possible and plausible in a democratic context whereby uh, there is a space for that kind of theatrical politics. Uh, many people would argue that um, those kinds of policies, uh, those kinds of strategies and tactics, excuse me, don't really have uh, much play in a um, more peaceful context. And so I think um, Gandhi would be inclined to disagree here because, as I'm reading him anyway, he uh, is making a very strong claim that that, that, that nonviolence is always and everywhere um, the choice um, for all of us. Uh, we, we should never ever hesitate in the face of pursuing nonviolent ways of interacting with each other. Central, of course, to this uh, argument is the concept of Atma. Uh, atma refers to the burdens of life, the idea of practice um, as a way of overcoming the, the uh, fear of uh, one's flesh or one's body being hurt or injured, the fear of pain. So Atma is, is, is where we go when we go beyond um, the love of our own body, and that's where we find honor, he says, in sort of transcending the physical feelings of our body and uh, absorbing and, and, and directing and, and, and investing our lives exclusively in the pursuit of, um, of peace. If we find honor, then, of course, there is no cause for fear, he seems to be saying, um, because we will have uh, realized that the pains of the body are simply just the pains of the body, and they're they're nothing really com in comparison to the ha the pains of a broken spirit, or a spirit that has that is lost its courage, in the face of what must be done in order to achieve justice. So um, one of the things that he reminds us then is the fact that 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 life, you know, while there are burdens in life, there are pains and sufferings in life. There is a higher law. Um, there, there is a uh, all kinds of subjectification that can befall us physically, but our minds, so long as they're free, we can transcend, we can uh, believe in higher ideals, and if we don't fight for those higher ideals, we have lost everything. So courage is also necessary, and I think this sort of speaks to the practice of meditation, or the idea, the tradition of meditation, to a certain extent, you know, there's this claim that contemporary meditation practitioners use. They say you need a, you need ten thousand hours of practice of meditation in your life in order to get it right. And um, think about that. That's minimally. I mean, even if you were really working on it, that's about thirty years of practice of meditation every day for an hour um, to to get it right. And my math might be a little bit off there, but ballpark. And so. Um, uh, Gandhi also seems to be suggesting that you know it, 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 one doesn't get atma correct the first time, transcending the body's fears the first time, as he says himself. You know, were he confronted by a snake, he would probably you know kill the snake. I mean, uh, even though he knows it's wrong to do that, um, but uh, that uh, there's a kind of a physical motivation, a, a, a motivation of the body, if you will, that gets in the way of the motivation of the spirit. And in that, I think Gandhi's also sort of recognizing for himself a kind of a realism there. There's a realistic distinction where he's sort of just accepting that such a thing as human nature uh, can exist in the animalistic sense. But it, but, but the important thing is that he's suggesting that if you look at the telos of history, if you look at the way human civilizations have evolved um, from primitive wandering around hunter-gathering societies to agricultural societies to today's modern societies. There seems to be a kind of a, 
an increasing complexity to the human society and an increasing tendency for human beings to put aside their individual pride and avarice and embrace a kind of a moderation and and in that he seems to see an unwinding of of a kind of a telos or a direction of history wherein the spiritual component of human life can potentially be further realized although i think of course he is also aware of some of the downfalls of technology much like camus was in the previous slide and technological life more specifically so let's just uh, clarify what we mean by himsa versus ahimsa himsa of course is the i guess the self-loving of the uh the self-loving tendency of the soul and ahimsa is the commitment of that soul to something uh, higher to a sort of a freedom or a liberation that um, can only be found through uh, not just a struggle against the tyrant, but a struggle also against the sort of tyrant within, I think that's a very important thing. And uh, it's only through through uh, a commitment to Ahimsa, uh, the principle of Ahimsa, that we will uh, ever really find uh, freedom. Satyagraha, on the other hand, is a willingness to take the suffering that uh, can happen in combat, which you wish to uh, heap on another person, and a willingness to accept that pain and that suffering into oneself. Not because you are uh, kind of crazy or anything, but because you realize that that's the only real way to transform your enemy, is to take his pain, not to hurt him, but to take his pain and suffering and take it within yourself. Um, so, um, do uh, one thing that I think he makes very clear is that, you know, this, t this the being confronted with this kind of strategy this kind of passive resistance, he says, um, it's it's it 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 works, right? It's a way of, as he says, of securing personal uh, rights, of of securing rights through suffering, and um, it uh, terrifies the authorities. So don't be naive, he says. It's not like the authorities are just going to let you do whatever you want. There is a risk in passive resistance, and so it does take a kind of a willpower. Um, not everyone's going to have it. Not everyone's going to understand it the same way. Uh, he says that there needs to be a sort of deliberate judgment uh, that everyone engages in so that they figure out what amount of soul force or what direction of soul force is required for them at a given time. Um, but nevertheless, uh, the, 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 the basic commitment to, of, of everyone to some form of it is very important. Um, or else we will not, uh, at least I think he's obviously referring to India here, India will not be free unless it um, becomes uh, non-violently uh, liberated or liberated through non-violent means. Um, and conversely, an India that were not to pursue freedom through non-violence would not be worth it. He, he, he says he loves India, but, but he loves the practice of non-violence more and he would gladly sacrifice India um, for the principle of non-violence. So, so is it? I, I think one of the things that's really important here is it's not just suffering for the sake of suffering. It's it's suffering um, not as a tool or a weapon, right? Uh, you're not using your suffering as a as a as a way of attacking someone else. Uh, suffering is a side effect. Suffering is is a is an is something that comes through what you're actually doing. Your tool is passive resistance, right? Your your ways to achieve your goals are passive resistance. Uh, and soul force, as he says, but 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 pain may come through that. Uh, just to be important to to sort of specify that, and um, so so the pain and the suffering, he says, is not the sword. Um, that that much is clear. So so if we uh, think about his his approach, then I mean it's it's kind of the same as Camus. He's saying that it's it don't expect victory overnight. Uh, don't expect it to be easy. Um, there will be a lot of pain, a lot of suffering. And uh, you can be sure that it's not going to be an easy road. Um, yeah, there's a story recounted in the introduction to the um, the text um, about how um, uh, Gandhi led a march uh, to uh, a salt factory, and just um, the the protesters just committed themselves to to a very nonviolent form of marching, and they had the uh, crap beaten out of them uh, by uh, police with steel batons and uh, it, 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 you know, obviously it, um, you know when you look at that kind of an event and you just say well my god these people are being sort of mowed down here um, it, one wonders is it worth it but um, it is better 
uh, to achieve uh, your liberation through through nonviolence, um, as he argues, because there's ways uh, in which there's a payoff later. For example, you can um, maintain positive relationships with a lot of the people uh, around you. Uh, you can um, uh, you can even maintain a positive relationship with uh, those who have attacked you beforehand and even be welcome in their homes because in fact you never really hurt them they only hurt you um, now of course we're human beings he says and perfect nonviolence is a very abstract concept it's like a mathematical line it exists geometric in a, in a sort of geometrical abstraction from us and that's that's uh, that's fine um, but living it in reality is, is, is impossible while you're alive, of course. Um, but it's almost like a line. You know, in meditation, they talk about coming back to the line all the time, finding the line of your breath. And I think there's the principle here, as, as we said before, there's a kind of a need to practice um, here. Um, the, uh, the idea of meditation seems to be sort of embedded throughout the piece. And um, you only find that sort of peacefulness through a rigorous... Uh, sort of f f focused uh, practice of it. it. It doesn't just happen to you overnight. You don't just transform yourself overnight into a peaceful person. Um, so um, th 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 there are times to kill. Um, there are times we, d we do kill. Um, uh, he's a vegetarian. Uh, he says he doesn't eat meat, but he recognizes that in a famine, for example, were, were beasts to be feasting upon um, a field of crops, it would be silly not to kill them, the insects and the, 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 the other beasts that would be feasting upon the crops. So um, we do accept that we, there may be situations that, that cause us to use violence which are for the greater good. Um, he accepts that uh, also that human beings are imperfect and that we will use violence just because sometimes it's hard not to. Uh, we are instinctual creatures as well as everything else. Um, and he says he himself has failed, um, and he recounts, of course, the snake example we, we talked about before. Um, he also recognizes that the line is different for everyone. Um, some people uh, will, 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 will find it just very hard by virtue of the culture that they've come from to, to be vegetarians, for example. Um, but I think the point that he seems to be sort of suggesting is that um, the difference between the man of peace and the man of courage is the commitment uh, of the soul to the practice of nonviolence, right? So I think he's he sort of uh, has more admiration, as he says, for the man of violence than he does for the coward who runs away from the struggle. Um, the coward who runs away from the struggle, well, there's no hope for him. At least the man of violence can be a man of principle. You know, he might be misguided in his choice of implements for achieving his goals, but he's uh, still a man of principle. So, um, uh, better to be um, to be violent than to be a coward. I thought that was an interesting point. Um, the power of resistance, he also suggests, is, is, is sometimes misunderstood. Um, uh, the, um, the fact is, one person, and I think, you know, when you think about when you think about Muhammad uh, Bouazizi, uh, who we've discussed before as being the, the, the young man who set himself on fire, um, I think it's very clear that there's, there's power in Gandhi's statement here. Um, one person can indeed set a huge example uh, when one thinks about the, the young man who stood in front of the tanks on Chanman Square, that famous photograph. Um, you know, certainly those, those solitary examples of the one person can, as he says, uh, bring an entire empire to its knees. So what's the difference here then between the person of peace and the person who is this coward? Uh, the person of peace um, is the person who uh, understands uh, that their flesh is just flesh and that the longer term health issue is the health of the soul. Um, India, as a country, in its struggle for independence from the British, uh, has a soul, he seems to be suggesting, and the, um, the, 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 the key thing is to find uh, your emancipation, your freedom, your liberation in a manner that is consistent with the needs of your soul. So finally we move on to, to Jean Sharp. Um, uh, 
Gene Sharp is, uh, of course, a well-known uh, peace scholar in the more contemporary uh, era. Uh, he is a leading uh, advocate of nonviolence in America. And um, in his writing, he's a bit more, I guess, uh, contemporary than uh, Camus, a bit more rigorous than Camus as a sort of philosophical or practical sort of understanding of the strategies and means and, and tactics of, of peace. Um, I think reading Sharp, there's echoes of Machiavelli there. In fact, there's echoes of Machiavelli throughout all of the uh, the authors. But the idea here being that these men of peace, if you will, um, understand that rulers are genuinely quite weak uh, without the support of the people. Even dictators need the support of the people. They need the people to be supportive, at least, if nothing else, in their fear. Um, if the people are uh, not uh, fearful of a ruler's power, then uh, the power of the ruler has no grasp upon them. Um, because the ruler can't kill everyone, of course. He needs people to to function. He needs a society to be productive to some extent in order to continue to support his power base. So, so Machiavelli always says, you know, um, it's better to be loved than feared uh, for a ruler. Of course, if push comes to shove and you have to use tactics of fear for a ruler, then um, that may be so, but Machiavelli does imply in more than one place that um, it may be too late for you if you're using um, a, not, a violent means against the masses. So what do we say then to, to people who are condescending about um, about nonviolent action, uh, who say it is lazy or it is it is like doing nothing. Uh, he says, in fact, no, 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 actually, and he has a long argument about this. He shows all different kinds of ways in which this is not true. And non nonviolent action is action, right? Uh, it, what what it is is it's not uh, pacifism. Um, it, it, so pacifism is is sort of a, an unwillingness to. Uh, to, to engage in uh, any th sort of conflict. Uh, Nonviolent action is um, a willingness to do something. And of course, this is um, this sort of like peaceful warrior ethic, I think, is what unites um, Sharp with, with Gandhi and with Camus. So there are three kinds of um, nonviolent action, says Sharp. There's nonviolent protest, nonviolent cooperation, and nonviolent intervention. And uh, as you progress from one to the other, uh, you sort of increase the scales of risk, both to the protester and to the state. The most effective forms uh, of uh, nonviolence in terms of changing or transforming the state are nonviolent intervention. But um, and we'll, but but that's not to say nonviolent protest is is useless. Uh, nonviolent protest is usually symbolic in effect. He says it can be um, uh, useful in terms of generating awareness. Um, using sort of street theater or various different sorts of means. Uh, of course, the echoes of Occupy and the Arab Spring ring very loud in our ears as we're discussing this. Um, and, it, and it can be profoundly effective for, for tyrannies because their people may not have full information and they may not have full access to the facts uh, to see, for them to see others um, uh, sort of uh, raising up their fists and to protest can be very inspiring, and I think clearly um, the case of Egypt and Tunisia if, uh, and, and, and possibly other countries too um, is, is a case in point. Um, so um, the um, next step up if you want to sort of escalate this is nonviolent cooperation, excuse me, nonviolent non-cooperation, that is where you withdraw from uh, power. You turn your back on power and, and maybe set up uh, ways of doing things that uh, do not add value to or add power or further material wealth or en enablement or capacities to the state that you're trying to resist. And the classic example here is the general strike, uh, which um, is has been widely effective and recently practiced uh, even in, in Greece uh, to tremendous effect. Um, in, in the in the uh, Greek uh, financial crisis, um, uh, I think it's been tremendously effective, and the results of that struggle are yet to be fully determined. Um, Nonviolent intervention, 
um, more direct still. Here you're actually sort of uh, not withdrawing, but you're more deeply intervening than a mere protest out on the streets. You're actually engaging in the kind of tactics, say, for example, that Martin Luther King advocated uh, during the civil rights struggle in the 1960s in America, where there were lunch counter sit-ins and uh, uh, occupations of bus seats uh, contrary to the rules of, of the buses, which were segregated at the time. So um, these sorts of things um, can be uh, re re relevant. In fact, we've just had the death of Margaret Thatcher and uh, one of the uh, sort of most memorable moments of Margaret Thatcher's existence was the hunger strike of Bobby Sands, who was a Northern Ireland civil rights activist uh, who believed that he had been arrested as a political prisoner and uh, went on hunger strike along with a number of other people and actually died. But as he was uh, starving himself, he also ran for Parliament in the British House of Parliament and he was elected and died a month or two later um, and of course uh, the memory of Bobby Sands it, it, it comes back to us as we think about um, uh, uh, non-violent interventions um, and, and of course you see there of course the, 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 the absolute risk to the protester and the way it undermined Margaret Thatcher's authority uh, was just uh, on, you know fairly profound actually I think um, if you've witnessed the street parties and uh, football stadiums uh, chanting uh, their joy at the news of the death of Margaret Thatcher, then you understand um, that uh, even the memory all these years later of those days, uh, uh, you know, shakes the foundations of legitimacy of the state. So, um, Sharp uh, has um, sort of suggestions about how like Gandhi, you know, advice about what happens when we are confronting a state that is willing to use violence against us. He notes that there are absolutely no guarantees, but the goal, he says, is a kind of uh, em embrace of the power of the state in a jiu-jitsu maneuver, right? And jiu-jitsu, or even tai chi, the goal is to take the force coming at you from the hostile opponent and turn that force against itself. And the famous, uh, this isn't in the piece, but uh, if you've ever studied Tai Chi Chuan, which is a kind of uh, uh, a non-violent form of martial arts, um, the goal is to um, understand that the force that's coming against you uh, can be diverted, right, uh, by perhaps an attack where, um, where, where no attack, um, y you counter-attack where there is no enemy, right? Um, you you don't confront your uh, opponent head on. You do the thing that's perhaps least expected, and um, this is what he discusses later on in the piece as the strategy of indirect approach. Um, and we'll get back to that in just a minute. Um, but in order to understand why this tai chi or jujitsu approach uh, will, might work, we have to understand what is repression, anyway. Um, it is a, it, it, ultimately when a state or a stronger opponent uh, wants to repress you, it is because that that opponent is recognizing um, that your uh, your your presence as a nonviolent protester or someone committing to nonviolence actually constitutes, as he says, a serious threat to the policy or the, to the regime. And so the, there's a goal of sorts that emerges here, right, which is to um, try to turn. Uh, the fearful attack of the 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 the, uh, op the, op the oppressor, um, the opponent's regime, to turn it into something that could perhaps um, undermine itself, right? Um, so there is a uh, I don't know. There's a kind of a violence there, I suppose. It's not a physical violence, but certainly you're using the power of the opponent uh, to to turn it uh, back against itself. Uh, and public relations is a big part of this, right? So, um, um, <clears throat> as he says, the goal of sorts is to alienate the general population from the opponent's regime, making them more likely to join the resistance. Um, uh, I think, for me, one of the great examples of that was the occupation of Tahrir Square in Egypt, where um, the uh, Mubarak regime released prisoners from uh, jail and told them in exchange for the freedom that they had to go and attack the protesters in Tahrir Square. And it was a terrible 
and cynical uh, move uh, on the part of the regime uh, to turn these poor prisoners against these uh, peaceful protesters and nonviolent protesters. But um, the uh, not all the protesters uh, used uh, uh, nonviolent tactics, but but the vast majority, I think, it's fairly safe to say, did. And uh, they had heaps of tear gas and bricks and all kinds of things thrown at them, and uh, m many, many, many of them held their ground and did not use uh, nonviolent tactics back. Be and that's important, right? Because, um, as he says, nonviolence as a strategy itself is flawless in the abstract, but the tactics are tricky. Um, where repression can be ineffective because ultimately it can alienate the population from uh, 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 the, the masses. Yeah, uh, the, the nonviolence as a strategy uh, in, it, um, it can be limited by the tactical difficulties of maintaining coherency in the group of protesters and, and making sure that they all um, uh, you know, uh, uh, refuse to embrace the temptation to respond with violence. And that, he says, requires training. Of course, he's echoing Gandhi here exactly. Um, one of the things he cites, um, which I think is very interesting, is the idea of uh, a military strategy, a kind of inverted military strategy, and this is coming towards the end of the piece, that there's a strategy of indirect approach, he says, um, and and the way you operate if you're doing this indirect approach is you you try to avoid approaching uh, the enemy along the lines of what he would naturally expect. You avoid the lines of natural expectation, he says. Um, and and you want to do this in order to kind of create an attack where the enemy's not aware that he can be attacked. Um, uh, perhaps it's even an attack into thin air or a, a kind of a, a you know. Uh, an attack against a, a phantasm. Um, it's an interesting approach. Um, if you've ever practiced Tai Chi, it, it, it's quite interesting how that works. Um, but but by doing so, you create create a way that the enemy sort of attacks you and then falls over himself or, or misdirects his force against himself. Um, in other words, as he says, you, you make them, by, by practicing this nonviolence, you make the enemy attack in such a way that he does something wrong. And and, and undermines himself. And I think, going back to the Tahrir Square example again, I think that's very clear that that's what happened there. Um, one of the things that he seems to sort of be impressed by is the possibility that should this uh, strategy of indirect approach work and should the uh, enemy be delegitimized, it's possible even that his soldiers may become openly mutinous. And clearly that did happen in Egypt when there were huge defections from the armed forces and they actually refused all the way through Tahrir Square uh, to, to do the, uh, to the, the, uh, the uh, enemy's bidding, uh, to do their general's bidding at least. So um, key to all of this then uh, is, is sort of a shame, a maneuver of shaming, shaming the, uh, the opponent, shaming the uh, soldiers into renouncing their violence. Uh, which they might otherwise be using against you. And uh, it, it, the, the, the way you do this is by absolutely rigorously refusing to become violent yourself uh, because the enemy will want you to become violent, right? This is what we call a strategy of escalation. It was used in, the, um, you know, in Italy in the 1970s against the, the Red Brigades and the autonomous Marxists and this sort of thing. Um, where uh, the the uh, the state used is what the French called agent provocateur, which is the term that we use to describe um, um, the uh, the tendency for the state to put uh, uh, undercover uh, cops and agents into the ranks of the protesters, who will then use violence in order to try to create a, a discrediting of the um, of the protesters and create a, a pretext. For the uh, for the state to attack because all of a sudden those protesters are now terrorists, yeah, and of course that's a that's a well known strategy, the agent provocateur. Um, uh, Sharp concludes by saying that there's a long, long, long history here. It goes back all the way before Gandhi. In fact, goes way back through the ages, and uh, it it probably will continue to be used into the future. But we don't understand it very well yet. The uh, the, the 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 way it can be organized. Uh, the way it can become more sort of scientific, if you will, or become a, a kind of a technique of peace. Um, it all needs to be studied and developed a bit more concretely. And so um, who knows where it can 
develop, right? Uh, who knows what else uh, can become of it? But uh, certainly, I think Sharp, were he to make a commentary on the Occupy Wall Street phenomena of 2011, 2010, I think he'd be very impressed. And I think he would say that the strategy has evolved considerably since uh, he wrote this piece. Well, thanks for your time, guys. I'll be back next week with a uh, discussion of religious inspiration of peaceful movements. Okay, take care. Bye-bye.